Well, good morning again. Good morning. Pastor Mike is out today. He's actually uh, in West Virginia visiting family. He told uh, his wife Janice that she could go wherever she wanted to go, and they could do whatever they wanted while on vacation, and uh, she said, well, I want to go see my grandbabies. So uh, they went to the same place that they always go. <laughs> so, well, I'm, I'm excited today, and uh, we do have a lot to cover. Uh, first of all, do not forget, I already announced it, but HCO meal this Wednesday. Don't forget to sign up uh, and, and help uh, with that. Bring all the stuff that you can. So uh, we do have a lot to cover. Let's go ahead. If you have your Bible, your smartphone, or your tablet, uh, go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. That's going to serve as our key verse for today, our backdrop. And uh, if you do have a bulletin, you may have noticed that the title for today's message is Paradigm Shift. There is an outline there to help you follow along if that helps you. And uh, the word paradigm is actually defined as a typical example or pattern of something, a model. And it, it really directs the way that we approach our world. And the phrase paradigm shift was actually coined by Thomas Kuhn in 1962 to describe a change or revolution in the basic concepts of a scientific discipline. And of course, we've extended it beyond the scientific discipline. We use the phrase paradigm shift in a lot of other contexts. But Thomas Kuhn goes on to say that a paradigm shift only happens, it only happens when enough significant anomalies occur to throw the current paradigm into crisis. So today I want to look at one of Scripture's most significant paradigm shifts, which occur during the transition between the rule of the judges and the rule of the kings. And we'll specifically be looking into the life and times of Samuel, the last judge of Israel. So go ahead. And if you do have your Bibles open to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, I'll be reading out of the NIV. The words will also be on the screen. It says, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare, and there were not many visions. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, today we live in a day and a time when it might be said of the world that we live in that the word of the Lord is rare and that there are not many visions. But God, we are crying out today that it might be different for us. I pray that we would be the ones standing in the gap for our families and our friends and even for our nation. Let us examine today our own paradigms and be challenged to pray for the impossible to be possible. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and read our scripture one more time before moving uh, back to the beginning. It says, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Okay, so this is the accepted model of faith in Israel at this time. This is it. This is just the way it is. God doesn't show up very much. He doesn't talk very much. We don't, we don't hear from him. Maybe he's out on holiday, okay? It, it is the, the backdrop that's going to guide us. But more importantly, this is the wrong paradigm. It's the wrong one. God is not going to let this paradigm be the one that rules Israel because God is not distant. He is not aloof. He is near, and he wants relationship with his people, okay? So God is not going to stop in his efforts to bring Israel back into right relationship with himself. So let's go back. If you want to just turn your Bible uh, just a couple pages previous to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1, get my words mixed. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 1, starting in verse 1, says, There was a certain man from Ramatham, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. And already we see in this story a tremendous amount of pain. This is a pain point. Hannah has no children. She has a pain that only God can heal. Verse 3, it says, Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, 
Her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? I hate to tell you, Elkanah, no. You don't mean more to me than ten sons. Right now, in this moment, ten sons would mean more to me. There is such pain in her heart. There is pain in her life because children didn't just mean I get to have children. Children had to do with your legacy as a person. There's so much wrapped up in having a child. And, and she says, she said, I'm sure she told him, no, no, I mean, you were, you're worth more. But really, deep down in her heart, she has this pain that, that needs God to come through. Okay? Point number one, if you're following in your outline, is God's paradigm shifts are often in response to our pain. Pain is the key word. Nobody likes hurt. Nobody likes pain. Okay? Uh, some of us have higher and lower thresholds of pain. Mine's really low. When I have a cold, I might as well be laying on my deathbed. It's, it's really bad. I, I, I really milk it, okay? We hate pain, but the good news for us is that God is not numb to our pain. In fact, the deliverance of the Hebrews started with the cries of the slaves crying out, saying, God, save us. Even a murderer, as we learned with Cain, was shown mercy because he cried out, this, this punishment is more than I can bear. And the nation of Israel was given a king when their borders were being overtaken. God is not numb to our pain. He's not numb to your pain and to your financial needs. He's not numb to your physical needs. God is there and he feels he empathizes with us. And he will not abandon us to the whims of a broken world. He won't do it. Hannah had pain and it drove her to the only appropriate response when we have pain. The only thing that we can do that is right is to pray. So let's go ahead and read 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 9 through 18. This is right after the first passage. Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. Basically, he was sitting on his porch. He lived in the temple. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. She was dedicating him as a Nazarite. She was dedicating him much like uh, Samson was dedicated, or John the Baptist was des uh, dedicated as a Nazarite. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. It's almost like he's saying, get off my lawn. <laughs> like in the nicest, most Christian priestly way. Well, not Christian at that time. but He was trying to say, get out of here. You, you, you're on my lawn. I'm trying to enjoy my evening here. But, but he blesses her almost in passing, almost like he didn't even really mean to do it. He's like, yeah, may God give you. And, and just as a side point, I wonder how often when we say things in kindness, how often are we prophesying to people? How often are we giving good words to people just because of who we are in the Lord and of who He is? He's always looking for opportunities to bless us. No matter what our priority and no matter what our motivation, God is in the business of blessing His people. Okay? He says, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went away and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Point number two, 
God's paradigm shifts make the impossible possible through prayer. Prayer is the key word in your outline. What is it that you need from God that causes you pain? Maybe enough pain that you stop asking. Maybe enough pain that you stop asking for it because it's too painful to bring it up, even in conversation with God. I don't think that this was the first time that Hannah had prayed. It said year after year they went up, and year after year she was provoked, and year after year she wept. How long will we pray, and how hard will we push? I want us to be challenged to keep praying in our pain because even though faith is really built up when we see the breakthrough, it's tested when we don't. It's tested when we don't see the breakthrough yet. Even if you don't get the answer that you need right away, if you get the not now answer, yes, no, not now, or wait, keep asking. It's not bad to scream. It's not wrong to scream in the ear of God. Now that sounds strange, but it's not wrong to scream and yell in the ear of God if what you are screaming out for is love and justice and mercy. It's not wrong to keep on asking. Seek what God desires for your life and cry out for the impossible to be made possible. It's okay to scream in the ear of God. Seek out what he wants. Do you want a child? Pray for a child. Pray for a child and then partner with God in prayer and action. If you want a child, get busy. But don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. If you need a job, you cry out to God for a job. You pray for a job and you keep filling out applications right? Okay. Pray for what you need. Do what you need to do, but don't stop pushing. Don't stop praying, no matter what the circumstance. Do you need a healing in your heart? Pray for healing and seek out a good counselor. Do what you must do to get what it is that that you know you need from God. It's not a bad thing. Because if God desires the impossible, it's no longer impossible. Keep praying. That's how paradigm shifts happen because pain pain doesn't help us. Pain just hurts. How's that for a deep theological thought of the morning? Pain just hurts, but prayer is what turns our pain into progress. Prayer is what makes the shift. Prayer is when we see God moving in the midst of our pain. That is what I hope for us as a church that we can, we can continue pushing. And what is it that we get? What is it that Hannah got for all of her pain and prayer? She gets a promise. Point number three, God's paradigm shifts give the promise of new life. See, for Hannah, the revolution is complete. She's experiencing the victory she ha- she's already looked at what her culture gave her, what her religious leaders gave her, and what her family said was possible. She looked at all of that and said, no. She rejected it all and said, God's not far away. He's near. And even though you say God doesn't show up very much, he's going to show up for me. He's going to show up for me. She dared to believe that God, what God said he would do, that he would do, and that he was accessible. And she begins, if you read through chapter 2, she begins prophesying all of these impossible things, all of these impossible reversals. We won't go through the whole thing, but she begins singing the word of God, and she is fully convinced that God is on the move. There is no turning back for Hannah at this point. She's no longer living in this old paradigm. And to reference our scientific framework mentioned earlier, she has now become the significant anomaly. She has become one that is an outlier in the data. She's helping to push the current paradigm into crisis. 
and help to change it. Will you be a significant anomaly? Will you be one that helps to to throw the current paradigm of a world that, that has a hard time believing that God even exists? Will you be one that helps to challenge that paradigm? To send it into crisis and make the world say, there's got to be something going on with them. There's got to be something different about them. Her perseverance through prayer and pain sets a nation on a new path. Let's pick up with 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. It's like a movie where you see the scene at the beginning, and then you go back, and then you come all the way back to the scene, like an emperor's new groove. Right? Okay, that's where we're at. We're starting right back here in chapter 3, verse 1. It says, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. That's the paradigm. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. I love that. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli, and Eli said, and, and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. You're just like your mother. <laughs> Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his usual place. The Lord came and stood there calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. So ingrained was the paradigm of that day that it took God three times speaking with an audible voice for anyone to pick up the phone. And these were the people that slept at the temple where God was supposed to reside. Uh, If God told me, well, maybe God did tell you. Maybe you're just not listening very well. I won't, I won't start preaching that sermon. But they spent their entire lives in the house of worship, and they're like, ah, it's, couldn't be. Couldn't be that. Couldn't be God. In 1900, the Lord Kelvin told an assembly of physicists at the British Association for the Advancements of Science, there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now, he said. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. Five years later, Albert Einstein published his paper on relativity that effectively challenged the presumptions that had been established for over 200 years. If you're having a rough time spiritually, if you're having having a tough time connecting with God, if you're not enjoying your relationship and you believe that the only thing left is just more and more precise measurements of Scripture, time for the impossible to be possible. Cry out. Cry out. Because our paradigms, our personal paradigms, do not shift easily, but they can be shifted. Max Planck, a German physicist, stated, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up familiar with it. Does it scare you? It scares me because I don't want to miss it. I don't want to die with money still left on the table. I want to get it all. I want to know what it is that God's doing in my generation, and I don't want to be one that just dies saying, well, I guess that was all there was. I guess that was it. 
Reminds me of something that Jesus said to a religious man long ago, you must be born again. There's no other way that you're going to get this because the life that you now lead, the body that you live it in, everything about you cannot accept the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is backwards to everything that you know. You have to be born again. There has to be a rebirth and we must become new creations. Here at High Point, we've had a rebirth. Here at High Point, we are not who we once were. Can I get an amen? We are not who we once were. What we were was great for a time, and it worked for a time, but we cannot live in an old paradigm. We must become new creations. God's on the move, but just like any renewal, any rebirth, any paradigm shift, there's, it's going to come with problems. So point number four is God's paradigm shifts often bring problems. Problems is the key. In our present story, the problems were multifaceted. Eli and his family were judged for leading Israel down the wrong path. The Ark of the Covenant, the symbol, the symbol, mind you, we're going to touch on that in a second. The symbol of God's presence in Israel had been stolen by their arch enemy, the Philistines. And, and, and now that Eli and his sons were dead, Israel was left with no identifiable leader. Things got really, really bad just after God really, really started coming through. Okay? It got really bad. And in the midst of all this change, there is another child born, and, this, and he helps to illuminate the shift that's happening in Israel. So turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 7, starting with verse 19. Eli and his sons have just died, and Eli's daughter-in-law is giving birth. Verse 19, his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth, but was overcome by her labor pains. As she was dying, the woman attending her said, Don't despair. You have given birth to a son, but she did not respond or pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel. The ark of God has been captured. So there's two sons born in Israel. One is named Samuel, which means God listens. And the other is Ichabod, which means no glory. And, and we see the juxtaposition of these two in this story because we see from one point of view, from one paradigm, from one context, everything has been lost. Everything that is of any importance in Israel has been lost. And from the other side, everything has been gained. I have to pause a moment and get on a soapbox can I do that? Do I have your permission to get on a soapbox for a second? In both of my Bibles, the heading to this section, and you can check yours as well, the heading to this section is titled, God's Glory Departs from Israel. Why did they choose that heading? I think that whoever wrote that, it's not part of the Scriptures, that's not the title of that section of Scripture that was put in there much, much later. It says, God's glory departs from Israel. But the point of the whole drama, the, the, the whole point of this passage is that the glory is not leaving Israel at all. The glory is on its way. God's always been there, and He never leaves. And that God's glory is not tied to the Ark of the Covenant. It's not tied to a thing. That's why He says, don't make any graven images. I don't want you to have anything that you can hold on to, that you can touch or feel that's going to get in the way of your worship of me because God is spirit. God's glory resides in the space created in a relationship between His people and Him. That is where God's glory resides. And I want to take a solemn moment and say something that might be a little uncomfortable, but God will stop at nothing to clear the path between your eyes and his heart. He will stop at nothing. If the Ark of the Covenant becomes an idol, he will remove it from Israel. If the land itself becomes a distraction, he will send the people of Israel throughout the earth. 
It sounds pretty drastic, but that is, the, that, that is how far God will go. If there is something in our lives that, that gets in the way of a relationship with him, he will remove it. He will even go to a cross, clothe himself in flesh, and die a sinner's death, rise again, beat sin and death, just to make sure that you and I can be in relationship with him. That's how far he will go. Second part of my soapbox. It's a two-parter. Why would we use this quote from a distraught, dying, and judged woman with no name to describe the work of God in Scripture? Why do we do that? Why are we letting her speak for what's happening in the story? She is not the prophet here. Hannah is the prophet. Hannah is the one that's operating under the new paradigm. Hannah is the one that knows what's going on. This unnamed woman says, God's on his way out. Hannah says, no. God's just about to get started. And here's the point is we should not let and not accept the words of death as truth for living. I want to repeat that because it's important. We should not let the words of death be truth for living. Somebody says, you can't do that. You're not good enough. You're ugly. You're stupid. You're unworthy. You can't you're not going to amount to much. All of those are words of death. They happen all the time. Anytime somebody speaks disparagingly to you or about you, words of death. And you cannot live in this life, in the life that God has designed for you, by listening to those words and applying them to your life. Do you, know, do you get what I'm saying? That's, uh, anyway, that's the second part of the soapbox. I don't want us to miss the fact that even when conflict comes, even when things look really bleak, it's not because God's not there or that his glory has departed. It might just mean that he's just getting started. It might just mean that he's getting ready to do something. Let's get back on track. Point number five, God's paradigm shift produces a payoff. Let's pick up with the story a few years later after all of the chaos and turmoil of this change happens. We see in the passage a complete spiritual turnaround of an entire nation. It's, it's amazing. We see that Samuel is not only the, the, he's not the only one hearing the voice of God anymore. He's not the only one prophesying. There's been a turnaround. And he's anointing Saul. In this passage, he's anointing Saul to be the first king of Israel. So let's just go ahead and read it. Verse 9, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 9. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day, all the, all the signs that uh, Samuel had spoken to him. When he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul among the prophets? I read that to, to point out that now there are groups of prophets, not the group of prophets. There are groups of prophets literally, apparently, roaming the countryside of Israel that you can just run into. And people speak of the prophets like, oh, yeah, those are the prophets. I didn't know Saul was one of those guys. Right? Do you see the culture change? I mean, this is radical. Going from a place where there were not many visions to now where, where Samuel is about to pass the baton over to Saul, there are groups of prophets. This is commonplace. The Word of God was so Thick. The Spirit of God was so thick in the midst of this group of prophets that as soon as Samuel came over to them, he started prophesying. How cool would it be? How amazing would it be if the Spirit of God was so thick, and I believe that it is here at High Point, but so thick that the moment somebody comes in the door, boom, they know. They know. They know God's here. God's here. 
I have to, I have to be a part of that. Gone are the days for Israel when the word of God was rare, and gone are those days for us as well. Gone should be those days for each one of us that the word of God is rare. The payoff for your pain and your prayers is coming. And I don't know who, everyone that I might be speaking to, but I believe, I believe there's, there's someone here, maybe myself included, that, that the payoff is coming. Keep praying. It is painful. There is, there is more than enough pain to go along, uh, around in this life. Can you agree with that? There's more than enough. It is what we do in that pain that creates the progress, that, that helps us to shift the paradigms in our own hearts, in our own lives, in our own church, in our families that need to be changed in order for us to see the payoff. I know that we preachers tend to line everything up in a way that sounds good, and I used five Ps today to give you alliterations and maybe help it be a little bit more memorable. But can I, can I put all that aside for just a moment and just say I believe that high point is in the midst of their paradigm shift. That we are in the midst of something great. We are. We may not have seen the, the entire payoff yet. In fact, I know we haven't. And I know that we've had pain. And I know that we've been praying, let's keep pushing. Because I want to see a bigger payoff. I want to I hear the promises of God. I want to know what it is that God wants to do, and then I want to partner with Him and do it. That's what I want. Can I get an amen? amen? For many of you here, you might be all over the map. You might be going through one of the biggest shifts of your life. You might be at the beginning, middle, or end of something like this. But prayer is the key to the process. That's what keeps the whole thing moving. He isn't through making us into the church that he wants us to be, and he isn't through with making you into the person that you want to be. In fact, he might just be at the beginning of the beginning of making you into the people that he wants you to be. Don't quit. God's glory is not departed. It's not departed. And God will do anything to clear the path between your eyes and his heart. Let me pray for you today. Lord Jesus, oh, God, we need you to change our hearts, to change our thought process. Father, lead us in this church in the journey that you have prepared for us. We offer to you our pain, and we offer to you our prayers, knowing that your promises are true. God, I pray a blessing over our family here at High Point. And I ask for your spirit to guide us in our every day. May we be born again so that we can better understand your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.